Okay, with our remaining time, which is uh, 25 minutes, we can talk about uh, connective tissue and adipose tissue. And um, this, uh, this is the last class before the three-day weekend. So we get a little bit of time off. So that's one of the reasons why we had an exam today. We'll try to fit that in before you guys get break. So we discovered that the projector is not working. So, uh, there, what's that? Oh, it smells like it's burning. Okay, if IT cannot fix that by Wednesday, we could potentially meet in the room across the hallway. So don't be surprised if suddenly this is an empty room. Class canceled or what happened? We just went on <laughs> So if that happened, I'll, I'll you know, put a sheet on the score as well, but we might want to take a look at the next score. The projector is pretty useful for us because in a class on histology, it's all about the picture. And um, I was saying that You know, there's a lot of connecting points between histology and other biology that you take in. And we want to touch on some of those, but we don't want to go in that much detail. So um, some of the molecular uh, level stuff, we um, just touch on briefly, but not into uh, a lot of detail. However, collagen might be an exception. Collagen is a great molecule. It's the, the uh, concentration of collagen in the body is the highest. Collagen one is all over the place. Um, and it has a particular look. And, um, you know, with, with stains, with like a hematoxylin eosin stain, uh, they, they, they describe that as these, um, eosinophilic. Property. So the eosin will uh, light up the collagen, kind of a pinkish color. So one of the things that we already pointed out is that when you have an, an epithelia is a packed cell volume and the connective tissue, the stroma, the mesenchyme is not packed and there's a lot of space in there. And because there's a lot of space in there, there's a lot of things that can go on. It makes it actually more interesting that it's free for all sorts of things to happen. And you'll notice in this chapter that they discuss uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, other cell types, leukocytes can migrate in, uh, plasma cells. Cells can easily migrate into the, uh, into the connective tissue. Why is that? Why aren't they easily migrating into epithelium? There's no There's what? There's no what? <coughs> Tight junctions? Tight junctions. Yeah, well, why are there no tight junctions? Ground substance. Ground substance. There's just not that many cells overall, right? The uh, epithelia is a packed cell volume. The cells are right next to each other. So then to keep that structure, they have to have adherence junctions, tight junctions. They need to have, well, they have gap junctions. They have all sorts of ways of holding them, holding uh, that structure together. Whereas in connective tissue, it's much looser. And it's, it varies in how loose it is. Um, but one of the things that makes it loose versus not loose is how much protein is packed in there. It's not really a question of cells. There's pretty much never a packed cell volume in connective tissue. So there's a lot of other stuff. And where does the stuff come from? I said this just before the, comes from where? Yeah, it comes from cells, right? And it comes from the mesenchymal cells, or mesenchymal, sometimes they pronounce it that way, cells. So those cells are factories for producing these molecules. So the body is not just made up of cells, it's made out of things that cells made, <laughs> right? So, I mean, in the end, our, whole, our bodies, of course, come from everything that the cell does. But a lot of it is deposits of protein 
and then uh, space filling molecules like um, hyaluronin or hyaluronic acid, same thing. Um, so that's kind of amazing that there's so much water in this. You think about our bodies and people say, well, we're made out of mostly out of water. And I was trying to describe uh, last class how when I work on skin and, and you have a chunk of skin, a biopsy, and if you separate the layers, you get you take off the epithelial layer, and that's 10 times the volume, uh, the dermis, the uh, connective tissue is 10 times the volume of the epidermis. But you take off the epidermis, and the dermis, even though it's 10 times thicker, it dries out. Without an epidermis to stop the air from letting the water evaporate, the thing just flattens down, and it becomes tissue paper thin, too. And then you realize, well, that must be a big storage of water in the body. You know, you think of how much water do we have in us. So the blood is how much? What's the volume of blood in an adult, roughly? Yeah, five liters. So that's, you know, that's one source. Uh, and then name some other sources of water. Some things that in your body is a lot of water. I mean, when you think about it, it's like all water. <laughs> Everything's got water in it. So your blood, you've got circulating. What's the other circulating fluid? Your spinal fluid. What? Spinal fluid. The spinal fluid. I was thinking of lymph. But, you know, so I mean, we haven't talked about the lymphatic system. Um, but, you know, there's a, a other circulating fluid. So, and then the tissue themselves are in this fluid. What's that fluid called? That is an equilibrium with blood plasma, interstitial fluid. So okay, so there's fluids, and then there's another kind of fluid, and then there's fluid that, that the tissues are in, and then we're saying that the connective tissue is mostly fluid itself. And the fluid is held in a gel-like state by, uh, by hyaluronic acid and um, proteoglycans, and you know, in general, you don't want to go a huge amount into the molecules of that, but uh, let's see, figure 517. You know, they, they draw this, the branch structure. But it's just a way of organizing other molecules, and in this case, it's water. So you've got you know, pretty like it's hanging off of, in, in a tree-like manner. These are connecting proteins here. And so why does it look like this? It's a crazy thing. But you want to trap as much water as you can. And so this kind of meshwork really does the job well, and it, it ends up giving you a, uh, a gel-like situation. Um, so yeah, in figure 517, they show proteoglycans like the hyaluronic, just the same thing as hyaluronic acid. It's like the, the salt version versus that. And some of these branches here, chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, uh, you, you might hear those compounds. Okay, so it's a lot of water. Connective tissue is holding on to a lot of water, and it, it allows you to have the space to have a lot of other things going on there. And we mentioned that the, there's protein, so it's protein fibers that's going to add some strength. And the type of protein fiber changes from sample to sample. Uh, a, a denser connective tissue is going to have more fibers. And we said that eosin uh, stains collagen well, so e eosinophilic fibers. If you see lots of pink on a slide and it doesn't look like cells, um, then you should think, well, there's a lot of collagen here in this section that we're looking at. And that comes up pretty often. So you'll, when we get into the different organs in the body and those tissues, when you slice into them, you'll see 
um, examples of denser material versus less dense. For example, in, in bone, different types of cartilage, too, is a good example. It's fibril uh, fibril uh, cartilage that, uh, that has lots of collagen in it. And if you stain with the eosin, you have these big patches of pink in there. But it's not cells, it's protein. And then, um, besides collagen, there's elastin. And elastin is springy, and it, it gives resiliency to the organ. Um, as far as you know, cartilage goes, in the ear, there's a lot of uh, elastin in, in the cartilage. And so then it's, it's more flexible, uh, as an example. But the skin itself, the um, the amount of elastin in the skin has to do with some of its resiliency. So a young baby is kind of nice and, you know, they're, <laughs> they're nice and plump and, and, you know, their skin is very resilient and it, it feels springy, you know, kind of rubbery somehow. Um, and so that's elastin in there. Uh, when people age, there's a breakdown of some of the elastin. And there's also a phenomenon called the solar elastosis. You ever hear of that? So that's the reason why you should use sunscreens. Because uh, the UV light from the sun is going to uh, chemically cross-link some of the elastin. And if the elastin looks like springs, like in a mattress or something, it's this springy material. And your mattress without the springs in it would be a lot flatter wouldn't bounce as much. So um, these elastin filaments have a springiness to them because they're interconnected with each other. There's, a connect, there's connecting points and they actually are able to pack down and sort of bounce back. And so solar elastosis causes a denaturation of these elastin filaments and then it, uh, it causes the skin to be less springy. So people that sun themselves, you know, lots of Californians a couple of decades ago, that was a really popular thing to do sun yourself a lot, get a nice tan, you know, but then what it did was age the skin more rapidly. So then you know, these people have very leathery, le leathery skin, and so the elastin is damaged. Why can't the body repair it? It can at some level, but um, yeah, it, it's a problem getting rid of denatured proteins. Um, not everything is taken up so easily, and elastin is not synthesized uh, at such great levels, especially as you age, and so it ends up being a loose about. Okay, so the connective tissue is all about uh, about having a loose structure, about retaining water, about having some filaments in there. Uh, there's a lot of action going on because there's a microvasculature connective tissue. So again, if we're looking at tissue slices and if you see any evidence for a microvessel, you might see a circle of cells. So that would be a tangential slice through a capillary. Or you might see something elongated that could be a some capillary. And so there's only a microvasculature in connective tissue, but not in epithelium. It's kind of interesting. Epithelia is packed cell volume, but there's no room to have uh, a blood supply there. So therefore, there's a blood supply just below the epithelia, like, you know, just directly planted right below it in order to supply the epithelia, but those cells are not gonna be as richly supplied. So what's gonna happen if cells don't have such a good access to blood versus cells that do have good access to blood? terms of what they're able to do with their lives. You know, if you don't have much blood, you don't have much what? What? Life. Life. Yeah, you don't have much energy, right? I mean, there's the, so there's not the, not the same flow of nutrients, not the same, you know, gas exchange, efficient gas exchange, um, taking away waste products. Um, you know, it's, it's a tougher life being further away from the, uh, from the blood supply, from the circulation. So actually, connective tissue is kind of rich in a way, by that measure, if you look at it that way. So the epithelias of 
our organs and our bodies. They're great because they're packed cell volumes and they have these important functions in terms of protection and absorption and secretion and all that. But since they're not so close to the blood supply, they're gonna grow more slowly. And they're not gonna be able to make as much stuff. And we were saying that the connective tissue is, uh, the fibroblasts there are factories. And so they're gonna be pumping out these molecules. So that kind of works as a design. And you've got these uh, fibroblasts in here. And because of the access to the microvasculature, there's going to be plenty of nutrients in here. So there's a lot of water, and there's a good blood flow. But there isn't <coughs> epithelia. So epithelia wouldn't be a good place to produce collagen. Lots of collagens. And, uh, in general, that's why you see the packed cell volume, too. It's kind of it's a one, I don't know, it's a cause or effect. You know, but it's structure function is kind of what we're thinking about. That uh, the connective tissue is uniquely appropriate for as a place to produce things. And the typical thing that it produces is collagen. So the first thing that you should always say is collagen. How many collagens are there? It's collagen one, I say it's the most common protein in the body. How many collagens? Lots. I think there's like 28, something like that. <laughs> so yeah, there's a huge number of collagens. So it's not just, it's never so simple. Um, that's called a family. Sometimes they call it a super family. I guess if I had 28 members, I'd call it a super family. It's, you know, what would, what, what's the reason why there are so many analogous proteins? Do you think? And how would that end up happening? Here's, here's an idea that's thrown out there. You can take this for what it's worth. But, um, you know, the idea is if you have a successful gene, if, you're, if cells are making something and it's kind of useful, then you get gene duplication because you constantly are transcribing that gene, and if there's a translocation in chromosomes or whatever, and you get the opportunity to have more of it, additional copies, why not? This is something you're making a lot of. It's good to have extra copies. But once you have extra copies, it also allows you to mutate one of the copies. It's like, well, okay, so we've got two collagen ones, but let's say we have some mutations and we make a collagen two. It's a little bit different than collagen one that can take on some new functions. And so then there's divergence. So um, there would be duplication and then divergence of the gene. So that would explain the possibility of you know, 28 different collagens. And they end up being you know, pretty significantly different and they are uniquely designed for various functions. One example is the, um, I was saying that at the base of the membrane zone there's lots of collagen four. And collagen four forms sheets nicely. Whereas collagen one forms fibers. Um, so there are collagen one fibers in the dermis or in connective tissue in general, but collagen four is not a good place for that because it forms a sheet, but it's an ideal place to uh, create that insulator between the epithelia and the connective tissue of the stroma. So this is where all the collagen four is here and none of it is anywhere else. And then um, we were talking one of the classes about hemidesmosomes, and these were hemidesmosomes because they're not connections between cells. Like between cells, that would be a desmosome, but a hemidesmosome is half a desmosome. So it's connecting the cell, not to another cell, but just to something else. And here, it's the basement membrane zone. And um, you, need to, you need something, some protein that's going to connect to the hemidesmosome. And it turns out that collagen 7 is great for that. Because it's a smaller, uh, smaller uh, triple helix and it's a good connecting molecule to have. So it's only used kind of in, in situations like that. And collagen 4 is only used as this surface sheet, ideally between uh, epithelia mesenchyme. And collagen 7 is you know, pretty much only used when there's something to connect between the connective tissue and, and the 
memorabilia. You use this as a connecting point. So these collagens have these unique functions. Uh, so, you know, we don't we won't, don't want to go too much into collagen. But then, you know, one of the things about collagen that's so amazing too is that it's a big medical problem, a huge medical problem. What is that called? Why would collagen, the deposition of collagen, why would that pose a threat? Why is that a difficult thing for us and for other animals? Well, when you when you get a bad cut, you know, and maybe it doesn't heal over so well, and then you've got, you know, you can sort of see that we're, we're yeah, I, I had a bad cut on my hand, and I, just, I still could see where, where that dog bit me, and I can still see the tooth mark in my, in my palm here. So why is that? Scarring, right? So I scarred there. So that was a, a, a not, you know, not perfect regeneration of skin. There was a, a damage and the skin needed to cover it up. So how did it do that? The connective tissue said, okay, well, there's a hole, there's damage, there's a wound. And that wound, well, it did a couple of things. It, First of all, it messed up the circulation, right? Because the wound went into the dermis here, and so the, the blood flow is uh, impaired. And just the idea of having a wound means that there's junk that can get in there. You know, a little bacteria and yeast, beasties, <laughs> and you know, funny looking mold things, and you know, all sorts of stuff can get accumulate into that wound. And so it really makes sense for any organism to try to uh, seal up any defect ASAP. And so what's the quickest way to do that? Regenerating whole cells or making goop? And it turns out goop. <laughs> Goop's the way to do it. Because these fibroblasts down here, these are experts at regenerating uh, proteins. They don't have to make a whole cell. They just need to make protein. So they're able to do that, and they lay down a lot of uh, collagen, and it's collagen one mostly, and that's a scar. How, okay, so that's the situation in skin. What about other organs? If there's damage to cartilage in your knee, um, is that gonna heal okay? Or depends on how bad the damage is. If it, if it really gets into damaging beyond the, um, superficial layers of uh, cartilage, then there's a potential that the best your body can do is scar. So you'll, you'll scar there. And the reason why it's difficult to regenerate cartilage after damage is because it scars. How about a heart attack? So a heart attack is improper blood flow to the heart muscle itself. So it kind of seizes up because it's not getting enough blood flow to keep it going. Uh, so without blood, there's going to be tissue damage, cell death. And then once there's a dead area of the heart, what's it going to do? Well, it can, does it have time to regenerate heart muscle, all that heart muscle? No. So if there's dead material there, what's it going to do? It's going to scar. So the fibroblast and connective tissue is going to pump out collagen. It's going to be a big scar. Do you think, is your heart going to function okay with that scar? No. You'll never be the same. So that's a reason to try to avoid scarring. But um, in general, that whole phenomenon of scarring is a huge medical problem called fibrosis. And it takes place everywhere in the body. So that's something to keep in mind too. I guess we're, we're done with the class. But uh, uh, you know, keep this in mind that connective tissue is a unique area with a lot of advantages. It's a factor for collagen. When, when that goes awry, you have a medical problem. Yeah, fibrosis. So, uh, yeah, have a good uh, three-day weekend, President's Day. Anybody going to try to go skiing? Then uh, it's finally rained and maybe it's snowing. No? We've all given up on that. One this week. So I'll see you on Wednesday. And as I said, if this, if this projector's not fixed right now, we'll be next to our problem. Thank you.